May I request everyone to please settle down and take your seats. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Confederation of Indian Industry, I'd like to welcome all of you to this evening's CEO Roundtable on AI Adoption in Corporates. To begin the session, I'd like to invite Mr. Ankush Kora, Executive Director and CIO, DCM Sriram Limited, to present his case study on AI adoption in industry. Can we have you here, please? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. At the onset, I would like to thank CII for giving us an opportunity to present our business AI vision that we are going to share in a couple of minutes from now. I represent DCM Shriram Limited, a diversified conglomerate having a rich legacy of around 134 years. We have always been a trailblazer, and we have harped technology to the hilt as and where we got an opportunity. And this has happened under the guidance and leadership of our Joint Managing Director, Mr. Ajit Shira. So he is present with us over here. So ladies and gentlemen, we are at the beginning of a new era where we are saying that we want to transform the journey using the Gen AI technologies, I think the AI technology per se, and obviously Gen AI, which is catching up to the speed now. And we want to focus in terms of leveraging these technologies in our environment and making it work. So our basic aim is to draw tangible and impactful outcomes for our businesses by harnessing these new gen technologies. So with this, I would like to start with my presentation. So I would just take a minute in terms of introducing um, all of you in terms of what DCM Shiram is. DCM Shiram is a leading business conglomerate with a group turnover of around 12,080 crores as of financial year 22-23. Our business portfolios are, are divided into three domains. So the agribusiness, the chlore business, and the value-added business. The agri-business agri is on the input and the output side, where we certainly manufacture those things, uh, both on the input and the output side. And also on the merchandising side, we have seeds, crop care chemicals, specialty agri-chemicals, and stuff like that. We have another line of business, which is chlorvenyl. And over there, we manufacture caustic soda, chlorine, and now aluminum chloride as well. And we have vinyl products, which is PV, uh, PVC resins, PVC compounds, calcium carbide, obviously a small business of cement as well. We also have our B2C business, which is Finista Building Systems, where we manufacture UPVC doors and windows. And we have also started our venture into the system aluminum uh, uh, windows as well, very recently. Our footprint is all across the pan-India level. Largely, we are a pan-India company with a small presence in Philippines. So I think we would like to just talk about our evolution journey along with SAP, because we are a very old SAP customer. We, we started our journey in 1997 with SAP, and we used SAP extensively as system of records. So we have been using SAP since la last 26 years now. However, we transformed ourselves from system of records to system of engagement in the year 2016 when we deployed S4 HANA in our company. So we were the early adopters in 1997, and so were we the early adopters in 2016 as well. Also, we embedded a lot of cloud solutions which is SAP Success Vector, Hybris Commerce, SAP Conquer, and SAP Cloud for Customer. So all this entire en environment of SAP, we have you know, transitioned from record to engagement. But do we say our journey stops over here? The answer is no. 
So now we want to take this journey from systems of engagement to systems of intelligence. And that is what we are now trying to work along with SAP also, that what are the potential avenues, areas in terms of leverage in this platform. So we transitioned ourselves to rise with SAP this year. So we have moved to rise with SAP and we now want to use SAP further in terms of embedding the new gen technologies, including AI and generative AI in the times to come. So let me put it, put another slide which talks about bus to business. So we all know it's a bus. It's a buzz, it is you know, ringing all across the market. We are listening, generative AI is doing wonders, and it is, it is in some of the areas it is. So it has a lot of potential. We can write text using GPT, we can draw images, in, images using uh, mid-journey, and we can use speech using Synthesia or using speech, uh, uh, Speechify. And also we can play with the structured data as well using all these technologies. And obviously these, all these tools has a potential of summarization, content creation, search and q and I think all these are the basic capabilities of Gen AI. But the larger question remains unanswered. It is about the business objectives. At the end of the day, these technolo technologies has to marry, has to come along and deliver the business value. So obviously we are exploring all the areas where we feel that the business objectives in terms of a faster turnaround using our workflows, using a conversational analysis. We do analysis, and, but at the same time, we want to you know, take this journey to the next level where we want to use conversational AI analytics. We get to know a faster, quicker response to the queries that we talk about our customer, material, vendor, supplier, so any business partner for that matter. And superior customer experience is also another thing that we are trying to achieve out of it. We want to maximize at the end of the day the business results through, our, through the stakeholder collaboration and also want to have a dynamic and agile work culture, which is imperative, which is the need of an hour. So application of generative AI for enterprises is, is slightly a different thing than using a Gen AI in the, in, in the, uh, for an end user or an end customer. So when we say enterprise, we are talking of enterprises like SAP. How do we try to embed these technologies into the business? I think it is the intelligent process, the three pillars that we talk about is intelligent process, where we are talking about embedding in core. So when we say embedding in core, that SAP processes on procurement, sales, marketing, all those things get embedded into the core. The second is the business context. Obviously, the, uh, the chatbot, which is Joule in, in SAP's case, something where we want to talk about, should be the unified prompt interface for all our business applications. And we would like to interface that and also leverage Joule and try to see how we can get a unified experience using this, this, this uh, you know, chatbot. Of course, the last one is a flexible approach. So we can't live only with, within our domains in the, time, in, the, in the current situation. So Generative AI Hub is the underlying plat platform of SAP that we are exploring because we want to embed and embrace other platforms, large language models as well, be it um, OpenAI, be it uh, Google Bars, Google Vert Vertex. So all those technologies, so there has to be a platform which apart from running the SAP landscape using the SAP proprietary should have a capability to get, you know, embraced and embedded into the overall architecture of an organization. So I would like to present a small case where we are working with SAP in terms of embedding it to the core. So dynamic credit limit is one of the examples. It's a busy slide. I'll, I'll not take you through the entire slide, but just wanted to give you a glimpse of it that the customer credit is something which is a which most of the businesses would like to you know fine tune from time to time customer limits are there we are a, we are in a country where a lot of credits are there so managing maintaining customer credit is one of the areas where we feel is we see a potential of sap you know providing us a solution so we are working with sap in terms of experimenting and exp exploring a possibility of embedding it into our core so with this, we are saying we have around 8,000 customers. So we want to use the, the credit limits of these customers using the patterns which are already built in in SAP in terms of the legacy of the customer, 
the financial status of the cu customer, the daily sales outstanding, his peak sales, all those things are the couple of parameters that we are trying to look into. And we would also like to induce the external factors of getting to know the health of the financial health of the customer and based on that, defining a dynamic credit limit. So in today's time, we set the credit limits, maybe six monthly or a yearly for a customer. We want to make it more realistic, more dynamic as compared to the market forces. So this is one of the things that we are trying and experimenting with SAP. We are expecting a lot of business benefits coming out of it in our case, where we say there is a, uh, we can react instantly to the dynamic credit conditions, improve scorecard and credit risk assessment accuracy, and obviously the trusted AI embedded into the core process. Today we are, we are saying that it is a trusted one where we would like to build a trust environment within our environment. The, uh, the other example that I would like to just present it over here is creation of a sales order. Sales order is a very generic and a basic you know, starting point for any organization. And we create around four lakh sales order for all our businesses, diverse businesses in a year. Now it is about the, the, the way it is built up in today's time is getting a phone call, getting some mails, getting, getting some unstructured data. You know, there are different ways of uh, getting a message on the WhatsApp, stuff like that. So we want to see that how can we make this process, you know, dependent on core generative AI capabilities. So we want to look at, we get the data, be it on an email, be it on a, on a WhatsApp. So all this data will automatically get fetched within the SAP system and SAP will pull that data back into the sales order and do the rest of the processing. I think it is going to help us save a lot of manual efforts because creating four lakh, four lakh sales order in a year is a huge number. And also the improvement of data quality is also expected because the chances of error goes down drastically. SAP Joule is also thing, another thing that we are exploring. SAP has started embedding this into the success factor for yeah, you know, onboarding for uh, trying to use it, you know, preparing question and answers for interviews, also preparing the job description. So I think this is where we are trying to use Joul. We would also be using Joul into some kind of an open environment using ABAP, GPT, and CAP GPT of SAP. We would like to embed that into the Joul environment and take it forward and make it a front-end, you know, chatbot for our organization. Open flexible AI generative AI hub I already talked about. So we want to be, you know, f have flexibility in terms of embedding and embracing all partner ecosystem, be it Anthropic, LX Alpha, AWS, Cohere, Google. So I think these are the areas where we are trying to work with SAP in terms of getting the APIs released from these uh, companies and get it absorbed within the SAP landscape so that the entire end-to-end -end cycle works seamlessly. So I would just like to talk about the key takeaways. I think there are a couple of things, the experience that we would like to just put it on the table. I think it is, we will have to embark on this journey. We will obviously have to make a start somewhere sometime. We will have to explore the possibility. We will certainly identify the business use cases is one of the initial prerequisites in terms of you know, embarking on this journey. Then we will have to experiment. I think there is, there is a time when we will, where we will you know, taste success and at times the failures will also come our way. We will have to experiment and adopt and embrace the successes and just leave the failures behind. We will have to embrace the new way of working. I think this is something which is extremely important. We all are undergoing a change. We will have to unlearn and relearn a lot of things. I think this is the thing that we will, within the organizations, within the leaderships, we are trying to work that out and build a culture where people should certainly leave the bag and baggage behind and try to embrace the new way of working. Evolve, obviously walking with the speed of technology. Technology pace is extremely fast. And you know, catching up to the speed of the technology is also a task that we would like to certainly see and evolve. As in new, new technologies comes, we will have to pick and choose, experiment and see what works in our environment and move ahead with it. And lastly, ensure trust. I think security is, in, is an overarching theme as far as all these technologies go. We cannot live without security. So we will have to ensure that there is an adequate security checks and controls into the environment which can help the businesses run smoother, faster, better in an agile manner. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Korra. Now to give the opening remarks, I'd like to invite Mr. Tarun Soni, Co-Chairman, CI Task Force on Bioenergy, and Vice Chairman and Managing Director, Triveni Engineering and Industries Limited. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. AI has made significant strides in India and plays a pivotal role in the ongoing Indian digital revolution that's reshaping our societies and businesses. India has witnessed notable developments in AI with applications in various economic priority sectors. I have great pleasure today to welcome Mr. Abhishek Singh, Additional Secretary Methi, President and CEO of the National E-Governance Division of Methi and Managing Director and CEO of the Digital, Corporation, uh, Digital India Corporation. And I want to thank him for joining us for this important roundtable, which is focused on AI adoption in corporates. And you'll forgive me, I've left out a fourth position that he has just told me that he is also responsible for. So, um, Mr. Singh, congratulations for successfully hosting the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence Summit uh, last week. It's also heartening to note that the Honorable Prime Minister unveiled India's AI mission at the GPAI Summit, highlighting the role in agriculture and in education. The initiative aims to democratize AI skills, address societal inequalities, and promote responsible AI development for global leadership. I acknowledge the contribution of Methi to accelerate the growth of the AI innovation ecosystem in India. The initiatives led by Methi in AI have been extremely encouraging for all industries, startups, and other stakeholders. In addition, uh, Puneet and Thomas, who are also on the panel today, will be talking about the landscape of AI and its continuously evolving shape. And your presence here today adds immensely to our conversation and in, in all of us gaining a better insight into AI. Rajiv and Mr. Singh, your perspective on AI will be invaluable in setting our agenda and the CII agenda going forward. Let me also welcome the CEOs and other members who've joined us for this roundtable today. Ladies and gentlemen, the adoption of AI in industry is not an option, but it's an imperative. In an era defined by relentless technological progress, we find ourselves at a crossroads. The fourth industrial revolution characterized by the fusion of physical, digital, and biological worlds is reshaping the way that we live and the way that we work. At the heart of this transformation is AI, a technology that has potential to revolutionize industries and indeed our entire way of life. AI is going to play an important role in achieving global competitiveness and overall economic growth in the years to come. Since 1980, CII has played a crucial role in building competitiveness and capacity in Indian industry. Today, we offer a plethora of services on competitiveness through our 10 centers of excellence, which engage in quality and excellence, green buildings and sustainable development, SME competitiveness, food and agriculture, logistics, water, amongst others. CII undertakes enterprise competitiveness development and professional capacity building for creating a cadre of assessors and auditors, as well as managerial experts in these areas. CII has also been focusing on AI as yet another pillar of our services for enhancing competitiveness in our industry. And we've been working in this area for the past few years with a focus on addressing many pertinent issues. Firstly, building capacity in Indian industry for adoption of AI. In partnership with leading institutions like IIT Madras, IIT Udaipur, etc., CII has been organizing training programs on AI for Indian industry. We also organize capacity building programs for C-level executives in association with international experts and Indian institutes. Second, taking steps to inspire corporates to adopt AI 
by sharing success stories of AI adoption, recognizing corporates with the CII AI Awards. Third, to promote global partnership for AI. We are working very closely with the National Security Council Secretariat and NSA in taking forward the India-US ICET program. One of the major focus areas of ICET is AI, and the objective of this initiative is to enhance collaboration and eradicate the barrier between India and the United States in artificial intelligence. On the 14th of November, CII, in partnership with the US Chamber of Commerce, USIBC, organized the inaugural roundtable for decoding innovation, the innovation handshake, the US-India Entrepreneurship Partnership, which happened in San Francisco. The session was addressed by Sri Priyush Goyal, the Honorable Minister for Commerce Industry, Consumer Affairs, Food and Public Distribution, Textiles, and the Honorable Gina Raimundo, the US Secretary of Commerce. Another initiative on international engagement is the launch of the Silicon Valley-based initiative called Evolve, which was launched last year, this year, in the United States. The objective of Evolve is to support AI and other tech-based startups in India and also create a bridge between India and the Silicon Valley for accelerating the growth of innovation, especially in areas like artificial intelligence. CII also makes us makes use of all possible international platforms to promote the concept of collaboration in AI for the overall welfare of growth. During the B20 summit, CII, as the B20 Secretariat, shared their major recommendations on AI with the focus on digital infrastructure, institutionalizing an AI innovation corridor, skilling and reskilling, and collaboration between industry and academia and startups. A report on the AI policies for business was released by CII, which presents a comprehensive analysis of both international and national efforts in the AI policy landscape. Fourth, CII has been actively engaged with government, METI, Niti Aayog, and other governmental agencies to articulate industry perspectives on AI. Fifth, AI is ever evolving. New challenges are being faced and being addressed in a continuous manner and basis by authorities in various countries. An understanding of these developments would help us fine tune our approach towards AI in our country and in industry. To enable this, CII has impaneled uh, experts like Professor Sumitra Datta, an international scholar on AI, and Mr. Peter Moores, Dean and Management Professor at the Syed Business School and a Fellow of Balliol College, Oxford. CII is now in the process of con consolidating its efforts on AI by establishing the CII AI Center. This center would work towards providing Indian companies with support, systems, and tools to enable them to adopt AI in their businesses. The center, with its multi-pronged approach, would create a supportive ecosystem which would focus on four major areas, developing an AI strategy for Indian industry, promoting AI adoption, AI development, and AI regulations to take the government's vision of Digital India forward in a movement-based approach. We are happy that SAP has come forward to support CII's endeavor and to enable the adoption of AI in India. And I believe that there are many areas um, of potential partnership for AI and CII to lead uh, and to learn from SAP's exceptional experience and insights as we collectively navigate the exciting future of artificial intelligence. The adoption of AI in our industry is not just a choice. It's a strategic imperative. It's about positioning ourselves to thrive in an increasingly competitive and technologically, technologically advanced world. It's about leveraging the power of AI to enhance productivity, to make informed decisions, personalize experiences, and to drive innovation. I'm confident that the CII AI Center will emerge as a one-stop shop for corporates in the adoption of AI in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Soni. And now may I invite Mr. Rajiv Memani, Vice President CII and Chairman 
India Region and Chairman Emerging Markets Committee Ernst & Young LLP to give his remarks. Thank, thanks, Sarun. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you and welcome to uh, all of you. Sorry we are running a bit late, so I think hopefully we'll, 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 we'll gather some speed. Welcome to my co-panelists, uh, Puneet, who I, I look up to as probably one of the most successful uh, prof professionals of Indian origin uh, and having a great impact uh, in the global area. So it's a privilege to be with him, Thomas uh, and Sri Abhishek Singh and Tarun. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, you know, the relevance of AI, importance of AI, I think that's, that's, known, to, uh, that's known to everyone. And I think with the uh, machine learning technologies and the way computational power is changing, this impact is only going to uh, multiply. And this is what is leading uh, uh, countries to establish AI policies to address ethical, legal, societal implications of this technology. And the organizations, on the other hand, the enterprises are focusing much more uh, on the potential application and the business benefits of this. Uh, and the principal challenge uh, of AI is how do you balance uh, the potential risks and societal impacts of AI uh, and at the same time fostering growth, adoption, and the wonderful things uh, that AI can do to human life. So, <coughs> uh, in, you have, we have seen some policy that's come out in the US uh, and also uh, EU regulations. One of them is very customer focused, the other, other, other regulation is, is very citizen oriented, citizen focused. And India is trying to see how we can pick up uh, the best of both worlds. India still has not uh, an official AI policy, but in 2020, uh, India did come out with a national, st national strategy for AI, uh, and, and that hopefully will lay down a very strong basis for future regulations, developments, uh, and adoption of AI. I know there are several task forces uh, that have been working uh, at it to look at multiple issues, uh, and, and, and in the same time, finding a way uh, that the growth in AI is not, uh, there is no impediment to the, uh, to the growth in uh, AI. We also believe uh, in CII that uh, AI is not something that should be l only restricted to what's happening uh, in the nation, but has a lot of external impact. And C CII therefore has taken up AI as an important issue for discuss discussions during the B20 summit. Uh, as, as, as some of you know, uh, CI was the secretariat for B B20 in India and is the secretariat and prepared a research paper of, on AI policies for business which provided recommendations in the areas of innovation, data governance, uh, security, privacy, skill development, social good, regulatory compliance and sustainability. And, and we've also emphasized that for AI, more than law, I think self-regulation uh, should come first. Uh, and I think it's playing a very pivotal role globally, and especially amongst the G20 countries, to see uh, that there is an open conversation uh, on AI. Uh, at EY, we just did a report which we released uh, over the weekend, uh, which was released by the Honorable Minister Sri Rajiv Chandrasekhar, uh, where we did some analysis, a comprehensive report, it's, it's there outside or maybe on the table, on impact of AI uh, uh, on the overall economy, regulations, enterprises, and everything. And we tried to quantify, it's not easy, we tried to quantify the impact of, of AI on the aggregate GDP. And, and in our view, in the next seven years, in the, the impact of AI, if rolled out properly, could be 1.2 to 1.5 trillion dollars uh, over an aggregate period of seven years. And by 2930, this impact individually could be around 400 billion dollars. So this is above six to seven percent above the baseline uh, GDP uh, that India is looking at. We did that by looking at, uh, we looked at 27 sectors of the economy, uh, which the RBI has identified, which will impact AI. And we looked at the expected cost reduction uh, the cost and, the outs and the output impact that will be created through, uh, because of AI and the impact of that. And uh, almost two-thirds of the impact was actually in the services sector. So business services, IT, banking, banking and financial services, retail, healthcare, and, and obviously uh, the, entire, uh, the entire startup ecosystem where the impact uh, on output could be the most. We also, as a part of that survey, we also interviewed about 200 CEOs, CXOs, CEOs, uh, CDOs, CIOs, CFOs, 
to understand what is happening in AI in India. And almost three fifths of them felt that in the medium term AI would have a very definitive impact on their industry. But only 75 percent of them had taken any steps, uh, significant steps uh, in moving ahead with that just because of uh, you know whether it was privacy, data, other issues, they're still trying to see how they how they move ahead uh, with that. Um, some of them have done successful proof of concepts, but they lacked a comprehensive strategy in terms of how do you make that uh, into sustainable business value delivery. And some of them were trying to assess uh, what the impact was and what uh, and what the use cases would be given the risks and other issues. I would say that the, uh, the, you know, we call them the startup ecosystem, but, you know, uh, but whatever name you call them, they and the, uh, the new age e-commerce companies and the financial services sector was probably the most advanced in the way they were leveraging uh, AI. Uh, and, and just seeing what we are seeing, uh, 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 and I think Mr. Kora laid down some very good, uh, you know, sort of examples of uh, what companies should look at. But what every day, what all of us are encountering are new demos. And what we are seeing uh, is that there's a long road from converting a demo into an enterprise-ready app. And, comp and what some of the best practices that we are saying, and I will not, he laid out some of them, I'm not going to uh, repeat, uh, repeat them, but how do we integrate our Gen AI strategy with our digital transformation journey? I think that's very critical. And that's why partnership with organizations like SAP uh, becomes very, very critical. Uh, the, uh, the other thing I would say is that uh, data is the biggest impediment. So for all those companies who are looking at progressing into Gen AI in a significant way, sorting out the data so that they can build in their LLMs uh, will, be, uh, will be very important. Uh, the other thing is there is a massive, as we prioritize, there is a massive cost benefit issue. So the cost, understanding the cost that it takes to run LLMs, AI models, I think that's very, very critical, and how do you optimize cost to, to do that? Uh, and then uh, skilling, HR, right from the board down to everyone becomes critical, you know, choosing the, uh, uh, you know, whether you want to be open source, closed source, what are the, uh, 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 sorry, uh, what are the kind of cloud partnerships that uh, one would look at? And I would say the most important thing, uh, what we are seeing in AI, is AI is an orchestration across the organization. It cannot be the function of the technology department. It involves the entire organization. So those organizations who are successfully implementing are choosing leaders to orchestrate AI across the organization, senior leaders who can influence change, whether it's in technology, whether it's in risk, whether it's in data, whether it's in business decisions, whether it's in HR, whether it's finance, so that you can actually measure the outcome of the investment. So these are some of the things that we went through uh, as we uh, surveyed people and as we looked at companies and. Finally, I would, uh, 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 before I uh, close, I would like to uh, uh, thank Puneet and Thomas and the SAP team for their participation and support in organizing the CI CEO series uh, on AI. Uh, and in CII, we look forward to working with SAP uh, in our efforts to improve AI adoption uh, in the Indian industry. Uh, and very focused, Indian industry is today very focused on enhancing global competitiveness, and AI is a very, very important tool of that transformational journey. So thank you very much, and um, hopefully we have a nice interactive evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Memani. And now I'd like to invite Mr. Thomas Zor Esig, Executive Board Member SAP, to give his special remarks. Yeah, thank you very much, and also a warm welcome from my side. Dear ladies and gentlemen, distinguished industry experts also for AI, and as we all see, AI is on top of mind of every CEO which we talk to, and rightly so. I mean, we heard the numbers. It's a trillion dollar opportunity with, with AI, but also it will touch everybody because the World Economic Forum just launched actually a, a, a survey which says that in, by 2030, one billion jobs will be touched by AI. So it is a massive, massive movement what we see in the market. But the question is also, why is that moment now? We all talked about AI, machine learning, deep learning, actually since decades. So what's special now? And ChatGPT just turned one 
year, actually four weeks ago. And what is was happening is that we have a combination on the one hand side on massive computing power, the GPUs, NVIDIAs and the likes, coming together with massive data and how we can process data. And you need data, as it was mentioned, to really make AI meaningful. But certainly we see a breakthrough with the foundational models, specifically large language models, with the transformer architecture, to make actually a broad variety of use cases happen. Because back in the days, we also trained these narrow cases, but now with one model, we can solve hundreds and thousands of use cases. And that's the massive way how we can now use Gen AI in speed across all of the company, across all of the enterprises and the entire value chain. And sometimes I get a question, is now Gen AI just the next hype and marketing bus, or is it something which is here to stay? And actually there's an economic formula which is proving that Gen AI is here to stay. And I give you the example. When the internet came up, the internet basically brought down the marginal cost for content distribution to zero. So fundamentally, if you put something up in the internet, it's globally available. So content distribution, di distribution fundamentally was for free. Why did cloud change the world so much? Again, same economic value. The marginal cost for content storage went to zero. And if you now think about any storage, it's for free. And now think about generative AI. What you clearly recognize that here content generation, content creation, fundamentally the marginal cost goes to zero. And that's an economic driver which absolutely will make sure that Gen AI is here to stay and that we all need to embrace this. Every enterprise will need to embrace AI. And for us as a company at SAP, we also see the obligation to help our customers to succeed in that topic. We proudly serve more than 400,000 customers and more than 350 million end users where we can touch how they work, how they run. And that's what we do with our AI strategy. And we heard already earlier about our strategy with Joule as our digital co-pilot, digital assistant, who not only understands what you say, but actually understands what you mean. <coughs> and that's the difference because we understand the business context. And that's special and that's unique to SAP because we know the business processes, we know the business data, and we bring it into the right context to basically deliver the most relevant, reliable, and responsible AI to our customers. And we talked and heard about responsibility and the ethical approaches already. And just to give you some context, at SAP since 2018, we have an AI ethics council in place with external participation, professors from universities, helping us to define every single use case it, if it actually fulfills the highest ethical standards what we, what we want to fulfill since 2018. In the beginning of 2022, way before the hype, every single SAP employee needed to, uh, needed to sign an AI ethics policy. So we take that topic super seriously. And we also don't wait for regulations. And we heard about the executive order in the US or the European Union AI Act. But we set ourselves the highest standards for responsibility because in the end of the day, especially in business, we need to avoid discrimination, racism, bias, and that's true to our value system of a company. But what is also important, that we ensure that you have the most reliable AI in the business context. And here, what we do, and to give you a very glimpse in what we do, on the one hand side, what we can do, what no other company on this planet can do, we will bring not only the, the real-time transactional data of your business into the context of the various prompts, but also we leverage our own SAP foundation model, which is basically trained and built on the data of our of 25,000 customers who gave us the consent to use their productive data to train an AI model. And now we can simply multipli uh, multiplicate the formula for the foundational model. 25,000 customers, more than 200,000 database tables, and each database table has more than millions, even billions of entries. And that basically the neural network, the foundational model of SAP, so the wisdom of the crowd for the entire history of every business question you might ask. And we bring the real-time data, the SAP foundational model, and the best global LLMs on this planet together. And that's what you've seen also on this slide before, that we partner strategically with Microsoft OpenAI, 
with Alep Alpha, Entropic, Cohere, Google Vertex, IBM, you name it, to basically leverage the best technology, but bring it into the context of the applications, to embed it naturally, because we truly believe that in the future, enterprise software will have naturally AI embedded. It will be the norm. In five years, we will even not talk about AI anymore, because it will be the norm and the standard as part of every enterprise software which is coming from SAP. And so we can optimize customer support, we can optimize sales processes, we can optimize cash collection to drive a better uh, um, day sales on outstanding. We can drive the optimization of manufacturing processes with visual inspection cases, what we already delivered for our dear customers. So I have to say it's the most exciting time to be in IT and to leverage IT to really digitalize companies, but also make company future proof for the future. And that's our time to be here. And I think it's such an important conversation which we have to talk about how companies can embrace AI. And that for sure is the CEO topic. So I'm looking forward to an engaging conversation. So thank you very much for being here and wish us a great evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I have the pleasure to invite Mr. Puneet Ranjan, Deputy Chairman, SAP Supervisory Board to give his remarks. Thank you. One of the advantages of being number four on the, uh, on the dais is that uh, everything that you wanted to say has already been said. So I'm going to keep my remarks uh, relatively short. I'm not an AI expert by any means. Um, but I want to amplify a few things that Rajiv and Thomas said. Another advantage of being old, like me, is that you have seen a number of trends. I've been in business for 40 years. I experienced the re-engineering trend, the first ERP trend, Y2K, the internet, mobile. And I can tell you that what we are going through today with cloud, with digital, and now with AI, in a post-pandemic world is truly, truly transformative. None of those trends, in my estimation, measure up to what this is providing us. It is going to fundamentally change, as the speakers before me have said, the way that we live and the way that we work. I think that's my first point. I have three points for you. That's my first point. I think the secular trend is here for the next 15 to 20 years and it will fundamentally change the way that we live and work. And as business leaders, it should be something that you to totally embrace because it will fundamentally change the way that you conduct business. And I think um, uh, Rajiv said something interesting, $1.5 trillion added to the Indian economy. And I think the EY report, the copy, I'm definitely going to take. It sounds interesting. But that is the fundamental change, the secular trend, the next 15 to 20 years that will be fueled by AI. That's the first point. The second point, and I think people alluded to this, is that I view this not as a technology trend, but I view it as a business AI trend in that it will fundamentally change the way that we do business. And from my vantage point, the change is both incremental as well as exponential. Some of the examples that Thomas talked about um, lead to improvements in processes, in the way that work gets done, and can lead to 20, 30, 40% improvements but I classify that as incremental improvement fueled by AI. And they are, in that category, over 100 use cases that SAP has already shipped out. And they range from core ERP processes to HR processes to the way that you do spend, the way that you interact with customers. It's across the entire value chain. But AI also has the ability to make exponential transformational change. The digital assistant that was just released by SAP, Joule, a natural language digital assistant, can, in a transformative way, 
change the user experience. Think about that. If you use US, uh, SAP, you no longer want, need to go to a user screen and navigate through multiple screens. You can send a question through Joule and get it to go through the language model, go through all the database to identify specific uh, recommendations. That to me is a transformative way in which people interact with data, interact with information, and can therefore make uh, transformative exponential change. But it is all business AI. It is AI enabling the way that you conduct business, the way that you acquire products, the way that you manufacture, the way that you interact with customers, the way that you hire, retain the best employees. The third and last point that I will have is that this is early innings. It's still early in the AI journey. And as I said in my first point, um, this is, I believe, a 15 to 20 year secular trend that is going to be fueled by AI. I'm looking forward to your questions and um, I hope you direct some to me uh, from a business standpoint and that's, uh, that's where my expertise lies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ranjan. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, Sri Abhishek Singh, Additional Secretary, President and CEO, NEGD, Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology and MD and CEO, Digital India Corporation, giving his special remarks. Thank you. My co-panelist on the dais, Puneet, Rajiv, uh, Thomas, Tarun, uh, Shakti, all distinguished uh, experts, professionals from the industry. I echo what uh, Puneet just said that uh, when you are speaking on a topic in which all experts have already said, there's not much left to be said. But I would just like to um, just add on to what has already been said is that we all agree that this is this is a technology which has been around for a long time, but because of recent developments, it has become like the most talked about technology trend that we have been witnessing, especially in the last year and, how, year and a few months. And what has contributed to this? Of course, two major developments. One is like increasing digitization across the world has led to creation of a lot of vast volumes of data. And the expansion in the compute capability has allowed people to process that data and build models which is like transforming the way we live our lives or we do our businesses. Chat GPT came and everyone started right from small school students to everyone in the industry. Life made very easy, became very easy for multiple things. Finding answers to questions or even uh, in office in what uh, we personally started doing in government like uh, we wrote write a lot of letters that we call DO letters. And very often we dictate that to um, our uh, assistants and they take the dictation, they bring it back, and then sometimes they make so many mistakes that uh, you forget what you had dictated. <laughs> so I started using um, chat GPT for s giving the bullet points that I want to write a letter to IT Secretary Bihar asking for f these five points. It will generate a beautiful letter. So flawless, much better, much faster, much useful. So all of us started using it in multiple ways, generative AI especially. especially. And we also felt that in what ways it can transform public services. So very often, one of the key things that we do under Digital India is like how to make government more accessible to people, how do we kind of uh, make people aware of what, uh, what schemes are there, what programs are there, how people can seamlessly apply for them, how they can get benefits that is due to them, that's their rights. But very often we used to find that, that uh, while multiple government departments implement multiple schemes, but very often people for whom they are meant for they don't even know which website to go to, which app to download, or how to access that. So we felt that can we turn it around and we said that, ki like, can we do a profile-based discovery of schemes? Ki like uh, people go there and say that I live in Bihar, I'm a farmer, my income is this. And then the system throws back that these are the schemes that you can use. So that became easier for people, they could apply. And then we applied generative AI to that and we said that if people can do that on a website or an app, 
can they do it on a mobile phone by using a voice command? So we are implementing a project called Bhashini in that uh, we used uh, uh, the AI models for uh, language translation because we are a diverse country, people speak multiple languages. And I always feel that uh, to go to the bottom 500 million people in India, 900 million people are connected to the internet, they're accessing online services. But the bottom 500 million people, to connect them, we will need services in their languages and also using voice for accessing services. So just like we access, uh, we uh, kind of uh, request an Alexa or a Siri, can people go to a mobile phone and uh, say that I uh, live in the UP, I am a kisan, I can get from the government. Something, a query that there. And then they get the answer back on voice. It worked, it worked beautifully. This project was uh, uh, showcased uh, to last year, January, to Satya Nadella when he was visiting and he had been talking about it at various forums including the Davos uh, summit uh, last year. Then we kind of expanded that and tried to ensure that if it can work on a voice command or voice input and a voice output on a smartphone, can the same thing will work on a feature phone uh, on a toll free number? A lot many people don't have smartphones and it works beautifully. So like we are adding more and more services to that like how do I get a driving license or how do I get a passport or how do I get a B positive blood group, blood uh, if somebody is in need of where is it, you know, which hospital. Because all this information is available. It just needs to kind of train the model in order to ensure that the answer is given to them. And this Bhashini project has caught the fancy of none other than our Honorable Prime Minister. And we got a request from him last week when he was addressing the Tamil Sangam event at Varanasi, where he said that the majority of the audience is in, uh, is in uh, uh, doesn't know Hindi or English, but they know Tamil. Can it happen that real-time translation happens when Prime Minister speaks in Hindi and those people who want to hear it in Tamil, can AI-enabled translation be done in real time? We're a bit apprehensive, but the Bhashini team pulled it off and last uh, Sunday, 17th, this happened and uh, Prime Minister mentioned it also about in that address and we got a thumbs up from almost all the Tamil speaking people who were there. And now we have been asked to ensure that this is done in almost every such event the Prime Minister does. Mm. So it's a good endorsement but it's a big challenge and, a, and, and actually this is going to actually help many people in India who don't understand the language of the region in which they are traveling. So the Bhashini app is already available on, the, on uh, both App Store and Play Store and people can use it to access that. So this all shows that technology really, really AI can be made very simple and simple to use by people in living their everyday life. When I look at businesses and when I look at corporates, I see multiple applications over there. One very common example is, uh, of course, uh, use of AI for contracts, uh, signing contracts, reading contracts, interpreting contracts. And there also, in fact, we have, we tried something again last month only, which uh, which we have worked in the government, and I'm sure it can work in the in the corporate sector for the businesses also. Like we do when the parliament is on, we do get a lot of parliament questions, and very often the parliament questions have been there for a long time. And when we answer to the when we see we give an answer in the parliament, we have to ensure that it's not only factually correct on this date, but it's also consistent with all the earlier replies that we have given. And sometimes to do that manually becomes very very tedious. So what we did was that internally on our machine, our engineers, our team members, they kind of fed all the parliament questions that we had answered in the last 10 years. And they trained a model which will kind of, whenever any new question comes in, based on the keyword and based on the context that the question is relates to, they'll pull out all the answers that have been given earlier and also draft the answer to the question now using generative AI. And we found that it was very, very effective and it also gives links to all such questions which have been answered in the last several years. So now we are using it for legal interpretation, for contract management, for ensuring that whatever we do for compliance requirements, we are consistent in with whatever RFPs we have floated or whatever SLAs we have done for our projects and all. So similar applications can be there. And uh, lawyers and, uh, and uh, those who are uh, helping to do contract management, bidders for pro projects, it can be very, very useful if we are able to use AI in doing that. The other big example that we see, especially with businesses and the GST network uses a lot, is in, uh, is in fraud detection, fraud prevention, and uh, trying to find trends wherein it can, uh, AI generated models can like detect if something wrong is going on. And very often we are not able to, to 
do that manually, accountants and all, if they are not able to detect that, AI models can be there, which can really, really help. Businesses can use that. Decision making becomes easier, faster. We all always talk about data driven decision making. But using AI for data driven decision making takes it to another level, makes things simpler, makes things faster, makes things easier to do and ensure that we are able to do uh, the things that we are doing more effectively and efficiently. It's heartening to note that uh, SAP has been trying to build up generative AI and AI models into their products because that will really, really help all the, all the companies which, uh, which use SAP products for designing their systems because that will ensure that it comes packaged in the, in the solution that you are already having rather than trying to build another layer on what is there, uh, on what you have already built in. So that makes life easier and better. As we go ahead, of course, uh, we, it was mentioned about the GPA summit that we had last, last week. So India, as you know, is the chair of GPA, the Global Partnership in AI, which is the, the kind of WHO for AI, the global body which looks into all issues related to AI. So therein, we have prioritized certain things that we need to, we want to push forward. As we all know, we are very strong when it comes to tech talent, when it very strong when it comes to AI skilled workforce, we are ranked amongst the top countries in the AI St Stanford Index Report. We are also very strong in the AI startup ecosystem. So we want to leverage these advantages to ensure that India continues to retain its competitive advantage when it comes to building AI models in the days to come. Two areas in which we need to invest in is, uh, is to build AI compute, to have sufficient AI compute in India. We are much behind the, uh, the world's leaders when it comes to, to building supercomputers on which AI algorithms can be run. Of course, we have Eravat, which is uh, which was ranked 75, 75th fastest supercomputer for AI models. But we are much behind when it comes to competing with countries like China and uh, United States. Luckily, three Indian companies have signed contracts with NVIDIA for building uh, AI compute infrastructure in India. The government is also committed to set up compute infrastructure that can be used by our startups and uh, industry for running AI algorithms and models. And the second important thing in which we need to invest is in AI research. Because when it comes to like publishing papers, when it comes to, uh, to building foundational models, therein we are much more behind uh, the US and China. And uh, in the foundational models also, we have heard some interesting things during the GPA summit. One startup, they announced uh, the first Indian language foundation model called Open Hathi. And uh, there are many other companies which are, uh, there was another announcement from Ola with regard to building a foundational model. So what we feel is that once we are able to provide the compute that is needed and build up a data governance, we are very strong when it comes to data because of our size and because of the digital projects that we have implemented in the last few years. There will be Indian companies who will be able to build foundational models in Indian languages. And when we are able to do that, we will be amongst one of the world's best company, uh, one of the world's top countries which will produce AI models and AI solutions. And that's where the $1.5 trillion or $1 trillion, whatever numbers we can think of, will come. And that will also provide a great opportunity for the large engineering workforce that we have to build solutions not only for India but for the world. And I'm sure that with the kind of support we get from the industry, we'll be able to move faster on this and we'll also be able to contribute to the global discourse on building the guardrails for preventing user harm for use of AI. There are many AI solutions which can result in, uh, in uh, user harm. Not every solution is as simple as uh, Digi Yatra. Digi Yatra is also, for example, a very simple AI-based solution which facilitates people's movement to airports. But there can be usage of AI that can cause user harm. So we need to kind of build, uh, have a regulatory framework which is light touch which allows innovation, which allows companies to innovate and build solutions without doing something that can cause any user harm. So that's our approach to AI regulations, much different from what the EU or the United States is trying to do. And hopefully that kind of approach will ensure that we retain our leadership in the field of artificial intelligence. I think that's all I would conclude now today and maybe if there's time we can have some questions. Thank you, Mr. Singh. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have the open house discussion, and I'd like to request Mr. Sony to kindly conduct the Q&A. Uh, I 
think it's been a very exciting session thus far. And I'm sure we've got lots of uh, questions on this uh, uh, very exciting subject. Uh, but before we uh, uh, just open it up to the, uh, to the entire group, I think there are two gentlemen who would like to make comments, perhaps a series of questions. I'd first like to invite Mr. Thampi Koshi, who's the CEO of ONDC, um, to give his comments. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> brilliant. Thanks for uh, you know, giving me the opportunity because, as you know, that I represent the latest DPI initiative from India. And so what I'll do is I'll uh, make my comments in the context of the DPI, which I'm leading. Uh, many of the foundational thoughts or uh, you know, themes are uh, common across most of the DPI. The whole idea of DPI is to create the digital rails on the top of which um, industries, businesses can innovate, billions of innovations can bloom. Instead of few enterprises ga and holding the complete um, uh, control on any segment. You know, like I have a light-hearted way of saying that we are trying to create the digital rails on which the business will conquer and not uh, create East India companies which sort of try to maximize only the interest of few shareholders. Having said that in the lighter vein, so what is a found fundamental um, principle that we operate on? Is that move away from wall gardens of platforms and move into open protocol based networks, which is a found fundamental shift in the way digital economy moves. And we've already demonstrated that in a couple of areas, and now we are expecting that it to sort of lead to complete transformation of business or transactions. So if I put, the, put in context what is the ultimate aim that we are trying to do, this is a very early initiative, it started just a year ago, is that every product or services which can be catalogable will make their product visible in this open network using ONDC protocol. And different buying application would come and help their kind of buyers to buy what is relevant for them. So what is the impact of that into business and what is the role of AI in that? The impact, if you look at, I said, the network. So what does it mean? It un two, there are two fundamental principles, unbundling and interoperability. Every com building blocks of any business transaction, whether it is B2B, B2C, whether it's goods or services, can be unbundled. When it unbundled, it gives opportunity for humongous amount of innovation and specialization. So instead of few platforms in any domain, uh, actively two to three in any domain, you take consumer products, food, travel, mobility, everywhere you'll see anywhere in the world, two or three platforms having 80 to 90% of the business share. Now with, uh, you know, and the, the, the proprietary nature of the protocol will make sure that network effect will lead to further concentration and s associated practices. This is something not just in India, challenge developed world also is challenging, whether it's in uh, European Union, try to address it through Digital Market Access Act, or the Americans trying to address through the American Innovation and Choice Online Act, or the Chinese trying to do with absolute control. We are trying to use with technology, markets, and enabling policies. So where does AI all come in? When it unbundles, it is going to create significant amount of innovation and specialization in each of the building blocks. Let's look at two big part, buying side and the sending side. Today, two or three buying applications are there in every domain. Imagine there are a variety of enterprises who have digital consumer. It could be fintech, it could be bankers, it could be mobility operators, it could be mm, any variety of enterprises who have digital consumers. Would now would like to extend their consumers a broad array of products. That means their loyalty now is to the buyer and not to the seller. The conflict of interest is gone. So what does it mean that it is going to have possibility of customization or even personalization using a variety of dimensions? And that become enormously powerful when AI becomes their age. Same as going to appli apply to the selling side. There'll be different kind of, there could be some specialized platform coming only for the auto sector. So there'll be some specialized application for coming for the financial sector. And but, there, instead of giving some standard solution, they are going to customize uh, not just the 
selling, but also their business processes, their business strategy, or the foundation on which this business is upon. And that can be driven by AI. And we are essentially already started seeing these kind of innovation coming. You had seen the kind of participation and interaction in the big companies, like you already would have seen the announcement by Google saying that they're going to give engineering tools like the AI, uh, uh, you know, components, et cetera, for industry to innovate on top of it. You would have seen the announcement by Meta that they're going to say these components to really help the small businesses. You would have seen somebody like HUL coming and say they're going to use this open network for completely transforming their traditional commerce. I just use some names which are all in public domain. But I'm extremely happy to see that there are a variety of enterprises are now on various stages of changing their whole businesses on, on top of it. and. This openness is providing them enormous um, capability to adapt the power of AI into their company. And that's just an opening remark. I'd like to leave it to you and leave it to you all the rest of the people to take the discussion forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's remarkable, I mean, what, what the reach that, that uh, OND, ONDC can have with AI, uh, considering the, the thousands of FPOs that, that you're networked with. Uh, next, can I invite Kunal Behel, the CEO of SnapD of uh, to make some comments. Thank you. Thank you, Tarun. And it's great to hear all of you, um, such fantastic thoughts. Uh, I had a question for, um, for, for Thomas, and I, I'll have a question for Mr. Ranjan also, given you, you said that you should, we should direct some questions to you as well, a different kind of question for you. Um, you know, we, one of our businesses is called Unicommerce. It's the largest supply chain uh, software company catering to e-commerce businesses in India. It handles about you know, a billion e-commerce orders a year. And you know, obviously, e-commerce itself is growing by leaps and bounds in India. It's gone from literally nothing 10 years ago to now hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars worth of goods. Would love to understand like, what are some of the trends you're seeing around the interventions and the disruptions created by AI to further optimize the e-commerce centric supply chains, given we are seeing an incredible number of digital native as well as digital migrant brands and retailers who are you know, now you know, moving online and transforming their businesses. Uh, so would love to get your thoughts and then I will take a, take a chance at a double, ba double barreled question and come to Mr. Ranjan after that. First of all, thank you so much, Mr. Bal, and I think it's a super exciting topic, uh, e-commerce and how e-commerce is evolving. In general, actually, the digital space is uh, exciting. And I'll give you some, um, some examples, actually. I mean, in a, in a new world, everything is individualized and personalized. We know that. We know the consumers. At SAP, I mean, with our, with our uh, portfolio, we are the world market leader for, for the universal profile. So we store three billion of consumer profiles in our Kikia solutions and we said we can personalize the offerings. So we combine actually this knowledge to, to help actually uh, to, to get better outcomes. Also it was mentioned um, the, the various uh, products, they also can be personalized based on the needs of the consumer. So bringing together the front office, the, 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 the customer experience together with also the, the variant configuration and also how you produce and manufacture the goods for the customers is an, is an optimization potential. And for sure, it's clear recommendations, personalized recommendations is already here since decades. So that's just the starting point. What we also see as a trend is social selling in social media. An interesting factor is now how, for instance, influencers are part of the mix for, for modern uh, commerce activities. What is now interesting with AI, and I see a lot of startups actually coming in that, uh, in that space, and we, we partner with some of them actually, is actually AI-based influencers. Because the problem with influencers is once they hit 100,000, 200,000, 1 million of followers, they get quite a big ego and they can be a scandal. And out of a sudden, you have a brand recognition problem with leveraging those influencers to drive digital commerce via Instagram, for instance. Now, with AI and the AI tool chain which you can use, you can actually create digital influencers, AI influencers, and you would not even recognize the difference. And you can change their behavior, you can change their appearance from one day to the other, depending on the demand, depending on what's hot. So what also means that AI will significantly change the buying opportunity in this regard. So commerce is a hot topic for AI. I believe uh, commerce will be a big, big uh, topic. But I also want to actually um, just have two comments uh, for, for Mr. Koshi, actually, because ONDC is for sure a very exciting 
uh, endeavor and we absolutely want to support the, the DPI and the digital railways, I think it's a very exciting uh, topic. And if you think, see the order of magnitude, this is for sure massive. We at SAP believe in open networks and open ecosystems. We also, to your point, absolutely believe in interoperability, which is a key foundation for all of the commerce what we see. As a company, for instance, we also committed in an industry network, Catena X, to open standards, how we exchange across the entire value chain in a secure data space. And that's something where we as a company, we believe exactly in that vision. With our SAP business network, we have more than five, um, five million trading partners on our platform, having more than two trillion of commerce in our solutions. And this is something where we absolutely want to open up and want to leverage also the, the ONDC as an opportunity to open that up and to really strive network. So would be more than happy to follow up on, on, on you also on this opportunity because we actually share the same ambition actually to make that more accessible for everybody. So thank you very much. And I hope that answered also the question on commerce a little bit. Thank, thank you, you very much. So my question actually is a good segue to what uh, Thomas mentioned, which is, you know, AI influencers, and at least one of the things that's going through my mind is, I would love to get your perspective, Mr. Ranjan, is what lies between now and the first AI CEO? Oh. Given you deal with so many CEOs, I'm sure you have some perspective on that. I think that's one uh, frontier that AI will not solve. Um, you know, it, being a CEO is a is a very hard job, um, and it requires um, a multifaceted capability set, and to be able to engage on a very uh, personal level on many issues. So I don't anticipate, I mean, I, I see the potential for AI, many of the things that Tom has talked about, but I don't see a um, CEO that is, um, that is AI uh, enabled or or uh, AI oriented. However, I did read uh, just um, this week that uh, Imran Khan is now, there is an AI persona of Imran Khan that is uh, making speeches in Pakistan because he's precluded from doing that. So if they can do that in Pakistan, maybe, they, maybe there is potential. I would for just an say AI in, um, uh, in, uh, as is normal course, Pakistan is 10 years behind because our prime minister did that in 2014. So. <laughs> Touche. Well done. It's interesting that we're also trying to test the limits on, on AI. Let's, let's open this up for a uh, more interactive conversation. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask uh, T.P. Chopra for his uh, question. Thank you very much for that wonderful uh, presentation. I've got two questions, one for you, Mr. Singh, and one for you, Puneet. Uh, you know, it's fantastic to see what the government is doing and the initiatives and the leadership it's taking on this whole AI initiative. It's fabulous. What will be good is to get your perspective in terms of what we in industry can do and should do to help you in the government to really accelerate the pace of what's happening in industry. We have one of our business units focuses on providing AI and driving productivity in manufacturing, especially on industry. Uh, would love to find ways to do more on that front uh, with the government. And Puneet, you've got a fantastic overall global perspective and you're seeing a lot of the developments in the US and China and Europe. From your perspective, what should we do more in India to really catch up with the kind of speed and you know enhancements happening in other parts of the world? Thank you. Thank you. Very, very interesting question. And what I would say is that uh, we do work very closely with industry, not only for getting feedback with regard to what we should be doing, but also for getting inputs with regard to problem statements which are there, which can be solved. And uh, sometimes it's use of very simple technology, not necessarily AI, but that also facilitates a lot of things. For example, one very key challenge which most industry partners face is the, is the cost of compliance. There are multiple public entities which seek multiple reports, returns in multiple formats. And very often, the reports that you have to file is already available with some another public authority. So what we have done, is especially with the launch of something what we call an entity locker, is that if you have submitted your returns and any records with any public authority and any other wants it, and then with your consent, that should become shareable. So that becomes ease for uh, ease of doing business. Over and above that, uh, we are also implementing a project called uh, 
Gati Shakti, PM Gati Shakti, which is transforming the way the logistics sector is run. Because very often the entire network of roads, highways, railways, plus other uh, physical infrastructure which exists, uh, it becomes very challenging for anyone to know where to set up a plant, where to set up a manufacturing facility. So that becomes uh, uh, very challenging to address. So the, the Gati Shakti layer based on a GIS kind of platform offers everything at one place, enables uh, single window clearances, and ensures that the speed at which you get approvals for building a manufacturing plant or building something becomes easier by the, by the intervention of technology. With regard to what more industry should do, I think one key sector which especially IT industry and everyone else needs to focus on is the reskilling and upskilling. Because very often uh, with the advent of AI, many of the jobs that was done in the traditional way will not exist and AI may replace some of those jobs. But there will be many other jobs that will be created and the power of uh, data and the power of technology will enable to create more value by leveraging these technologies. So that would require across industries, especially with the IT and ITES, for a massive program of reskilling, upskilling, uh, to ensure that we continue to remain relevant. And the other thing that industry can do is always leverage that. Already customer CRM, uh, the uh, customer service has already gone to AI-based bots and tools, which uh, resulted in, in uh, reduction of cost. So these are the things that almost every industry is adopting, and uh, manufacturing industries can also benefit from that. Plus, there are AI-based solutions which detect, which detect faults, which ensure that manufacturing is better and it can replace the manual checks of products. So there are multiple ways in which uh, industry can benefit by using this technology. Great to see you again. Um, you know, I would basically say first uh, embrace the technology and the potential that it has. And, and from a country standpoint, um, <laughs> growing at 6%, um, I don't think we will be able to go from where we are today to a rich country status if we don't um, embrace and enable our development using technology, particularly AI. Um, the second point uh, related to that is that we don't have the luxury as a country, India doesn't, to replicate the development cycle that the West and even China went through. The only way that we will be able to develop is by leveraging technology like AI. So I would say the first thing that we must do is embrace. Um, I would also suggest to you that uh, this is early innings. There is a lot of hype around AI. And while there is a uh, there is tremendous work that's being done in the United States, um, it is still early stage. So we're not behind in India. Um, the other piece, I just came from Bangalore, we've got where we've got 15,000 SAP professionals. 40% of all R&D that SAP does comes out of India. But there is a real talent gap. We turn out a lot of people that don't really have the quality that we need. So I think what we need to do as a country is to ensure that our people have the skills to leverage the technology and the potential that this provides. And, um, and I think the, the, the last thing that I would say is um, really leverage technology, particularly AI, uh, at a business level, uh, but also at a national level to, uh, to aid in the development. The next question is from, from Vinod. Uh, thank you. Uh, very enriching evening indeed. And uh, to the organizers, it's a fantastic uh, topic to pick up on. Uh, I learned a lot this evening. So my question, my first one, I have two questions. The first one is to Mr. Puneet. How do we ensure that AI, at the moment, if you look at SMEs, especially SMEs in India, or let's at least talk about medium, if not small enterprises. <laughs> Uh, they obviously uh, are not in any position to embrace AI as we speak. How can we together as industry and government make sure that AI becomes the tool for them to become competitive, not just for India, but for global, uh, uh, in especially now that we are talking of industrialization, manufacturing, export to the world? I actually, I disagree with you. Um, and I disagree with you because one of the products that SAP has, and I didn't yeah. want this to be a SAP plug session, right. But um, Grow with SAP is an SME product which, uh, which allows you to leverage digital technology, cloud, and AI. The 130 use cases that uh, SAP now has already um, unleashed on the market is embedded in some of that Grow capability. 
And so I wouldn't, uh, I mean, I wouldn't agree with you. I mean, would you agree with what I'm saying? Yeah, I just want to say, so absolutely, we should definitely follow up because uh, with, with Grow with SAP, this is our offering where we also, especially in India, quite frankly, have a huge success uh, with that program to help actually SMEs actually to grow dramatically, leveraging the power of AI embedded. And I think that's also the difference that for us as a company, it's super important that we make it super easy and seamless to just consume AI, that you don't need to worry about the training, you don't need to worry about the lifecycle management, you don't need to worry about the integration. That's what we do in our software as a service offerings for you. And that's exactly Puni, that's Grow with, with, Grow with SAP. That's the offering where we want to help uh, SMEs in this regard. So thank you very yeah. much. And and I would sorry. say that it, you can actually leverage AI if you use a product like Grow uh, to, to compete with the larger players. So I would, I would disagree with you. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, I'm aware of that a little bit, but maybe we have the different definitions of medium scale industry in mind uh, at the moment, but I, I won't take it any further, uh, but uh, certainly I will look, at, look that up. My second question is to Mr. Singh. Uh, you know, and you did sort of mention already the whole compliance bit. Uh, how can we make this whole EODB really happen through AI for India? And what I have in mind is, uh, you know, we have an ERP system, I'm willing to plug that in along with the GST network to the government. Let there be alarms and alerts being raised through the artificial intelligence system. Hey, this is where you're going wrong. This is where there's a red flag or a brown flag or whatever. Can we uh, imagine something like that happening? Uh, exactly. In fact, that's what is the whole intent. Because ease of doing business relies on the basic element of trust. So if there is no malafide intent and if there is some mistake that's happening, that mistake today can be detected with AI models. When we know that, like, if there have been, like, say, 100 cases or 1,000 cases in the past, and there's a trend, and if after going through tribunals, after going through hearings, if the final decision is that it was an inadvertent mistake. So based on that, AI-based models can be built in, which can be plugged into the various uh, software systems that the government runs, and that can be done, uh, that can be ensured that people are alerted if you are there doing anything wrong or if they're missing out a return of their doing something else. The other thing that is being done is uh, in for ease of doing business, as, as I mentioned earlier, is ask only once. Okay, like any data, any information, any uh, that, uh, that an entity or a citizen has shared with the government, and if any other entity wants it, instead of going, making the citizen or the business entity go through the process again, all over again, just take the consent. And if the citizen or the business gives his consent, that he or she is okay with sharing it with the other entity, that be the, uh, let, let that be. So whether it's a date of birth, a date of incorporation of a company, or your income tax returns, you have filed with CBDT, and the uh, ROC also needs the same thing. So all that can become easily shareable, and that would reduce the cost of compliance, ensure that the businesses focus on their core uh, activities, and uh, that would what will result in ease of doing business. Fascinating. Um, we have, uh, we're gonna take two more questions. And we'll just go in, in order back there, please. Just, just let us know your name as well, please. Uh, thank you, sir. My name is Nishal. I'm an AI and blockchain researcher for the past 10 years. Uh, my question is towards Mr. Rajiv, actually. Uh, thank you, sir, for the great points as well. Uh, and I seeing the technological gaps that are there, right? Hallucination and everything that is already existing in the technology, as you mentioned, the production is a gap. As things are said, you can write a letter, but sometimes models goes haywire and writes a different letter. So AI is very helpful, but it's still a process of a replacement in the puzzle, right? And you mentioned a financial impact. Uh, so as a researcher, I want to understand as a founder too, uh, when you say there is going to be so much economical impact in the level of enterprise, SMEs, and startups, which industry do you see making this impact? Because from end to end, AI is still not completely capable. It's augmented. So where do you see as a experience, like which businesses are gonna be the first to make this impact? Yeah. So at least in the analysis that we did, two thirds uh, of the impact uh, will be in the services sector. Uh, so whether it's IT, business services, uh, banking, retail, travel, healthcare. So the, the in efficiency impact and e-commerce, the efficiency impact and the impact of customer intimacy, so knowing your customer better, I think the impact of that on the output improvement mm -hmm. uh, is, the, is the maximum in these segments. So basically a lot of this modeling has been done on the, if you have lower cost and if you have output improvement, then what will be the impact of doing that? I mean, if you can, 
if you can reduce crash your innovation cycle, if you are taking one and a half years to produce a drug, if that can be crashed to six months, then what is the impact of that? So the, all the um, computations that have been done have been done on that basis. So these are the sectors where the impact was the highest. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. And we'll just take one last question right up front here. Thank you. My question, I'm Professor Charu Malhotra from a government mm -hmm. institute uh, looking into digital transformation and cybersecurity. So my question is to all of you. When we are celebrating generative AI, there are many routes of generative AI in terms of cybersecurity. If we know that LLMs are usually designed to evade any kind of infection in them, but there is something called as data poisoning that can happen to, you know, to change my prompt by prompt injections, etc. There can be techniques to avoid malware detection used by AI. And so it is rogue AI against our data. The third component which I'm very worried about is that all the data which have taken up with consent, 25,000 companies that you mentioned, could actually be compromised without being, we being aware about them as a significant data fiduciary. So these aspects of rogue AI are very important before we hail it as the next trend. Thank you. So an excellent question. Let's start from left and then go right. I mean, first and foremost, you have a very important topic. I mean, security in general is one of the hottest topics in, in the IT sector, and especially with the advent of uh, generative AI, the security risks are higher by that reason. That's the reason why it's so essential for every company to invest into, into security for us as a software provider, as a cloud provider, for sure, this is our core business. That's the reason we invest significantly into, into security. And that's also, quite frankly, the reason why we believe the cloud is the only vehicle that we can protect that on an on-premise uh, way, our customers need to protect that on their own. And for most of the businesses, quite frankly, to run an on-premise system is not their core business. But for us to provide a cloud service is core business. Cybersecurity is core business. And that's the reason, to your point, we have the highest security um, uh, standards which we fulfill. We are a critical infrastructure provider to more than 5,000 customers. And we serve basically all the governments around the globe. So you can be assured that for us security is, is top of mind. And that's also when I mentioned from our clear differentiator as a company for business AI, one of the statements which I did was um, relevant, reliable, and responsible. And in that responsible is for sure also how we deal with the security aspects of AI. For sure, we can go very deep in technology how we do that. I think that's, that's most probably today uh, too short now um, uh, as part of this panel conversation. But very happy to follow up with you on our security uh, processes which we have in place because for sure as a as a company which provides the most business critical software to our customers, it's clear that we do, do, don't do any compromises on security and the standards we fulfill. So thank you very much. I would just like to just say that, uh, is that uh, the question that you mentioned about rogue AI and things going wrong, is just whenever you use any technology, AI or any other technology, you have to always be aware of the risks that are there and the pros and cons of using the technology and not using technology. As also be aware of what can go wrong. So as we always say that it's all right to trust AI, to believe in machines, to think that machines are smarter than humans, but don't forget the, don't miss out the human element. The human element which is aware of things can go wrong must be there when you design your systems and ensure that you have sufficiently ring-faced yourself against anything that's going wrong. And this applies to AI as much as it applies to any other technology development. I've got nothing to add. I can just add, incidentally, Thomas, we were the ones who did impact assessment of SAP for India, thanks to the SAP India team to trust IAPA, the organization. And yes, I agree with Abhishek ji that actually we should not have Industry Revolution 4, we should have Industry Revolution 5.0 where co-bots is the way to look forward. Hmm. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. It's been a, a entertaining, informative, educative, session on, on such an important subject like AI. We've heard about the enormous business opportunity that it poses for us, uh, over a trillion uh, dollars, uh, the impact that it should have and can have on businesses, 
around the nation, na the nation, uh, businesses servicing the Indian economy, servicing the global economy, etc. Uh, some of the challenges, of course, that, that we will be facing, we just covered it in brief. Um, uh, the, the only thing that I would say is that, of course, uh, the, the logical impact would be in the field of services, but one hopes that the transformative change in manufacturing and in agriculture, the two other very important sectors of the Indian economy, would be, would be felt by one and all in a very unique manner. And I'm sure CII will play a, a crucial and pivotal role in terms of uh, delivering this uh, to its stakeholders. Thanks very much, and I think there's, there's dinner. Um, Thank you, Mr. Soni. Ladies and gentlemen, can we have a round of applause for all the <laughs> intelligent talk that we've had today? And I'm sure you're all ready for drinks and dinner. I'd like to invite you to join us all. Thank you very much. <laughs>